Good afternoon to everyone. We are hearing num number seven of the 180 regular session. This is the hearing on patterns of persecution of human rights defenders and the situation of women defenders in Cuba. This hearing has been requested by Foundation for Pan American Democracy, Latin American Youth Network for Democracy, Center for Action and Defense for Human Rights, Impulsa Latinoamerica, Civil Rights Defender, and San Isidro Movement. I am Julissa Mantilla Falcon. I am the first vice president of the Inter American Commission on Human Rights. And here with me today are Commissioner Estorda Alon, Country Rapporteur, Commissioner Margaret May McCauley, Rapporteur on Women's Rights, and Commissioner Joel Hernandez, a Rapporteur on Human Rights Defender and Justice Operators. I also want to greet the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, who is here with us today. The hearing will start with 35 minutes for the civil society, then 30 minutes for the Inter-American Commission. And finally, the members of the civil society will have 25 minutes. We have a digital tool, a timer that is showing us the time so that you are aware of it during your presentations. We have simultaneous uh, interpretation and these hearings are being broadcasted and the uh, recording will be on the commission's uh, channel on YouTube. I will ask you, please let your cameras on and when we are not speaking, we should uh, turn off our microphones. We will start with the civil society. You have the floor. Good morning, honorable commissioners. My name is Juan Carlos Vargas. I am director of the Complaint Center of the Foundation for Pan American Democracy. Here with me today are Catherine Mojena and Rosa Maria Pasha, promoters of Cuba Decide campaign. On the occasion of this session, our foundation and its allied organization, Unión Patriótica de Cuba, UNPACU, Civil Rights Defenders, Impulsa Latinoamérica, Red Latinoamericana de Jóvenes por la Democracia, and the Centro de Acción y Defensa por los Derechos Humanos, CAREF, express great concern about the application of systematic patterns that violate human rights that have been applied in a differential way during the last 17 months, a year and a half characterized by the economic crisis, political repression, and aggravations related to the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. We also denounce human rights abuses and violations that affect in a differentiated way defenders and their families especially their children. We will present the update of the main uh, repressive patterns that were presented in the here in the period of session 179 that due to technical problems whose origins have not been explained significantly affected the, the presentation. Then we will present the patterns identified that affect human rights defenders in a differentiated way in correspondence with the issue that motivates this hearing. It is necessary to contextualize in figures what happened during uh, 2020 and the first five months of 2021. Our complaint center has registered 496 arbitrary detentions since the beginning of the pandemic. This figure is lower than the um, the presented and has to be complemented by lists presented by other organizations. The arrest increased after imposition of specific complementary sanitary provisions of May 2020 and the declaration of national alert uh, that was um, announced on August 2020. More than 810 victims suffered harassment through the surveillance of the Ministry of the Interior. Um, and other intimidation mechanisms. Of these 219 victims denounced the impediment by security agents to leave their homes due to their activism. Several of these persons continue to be in a state of siege or suffered it frequently. Also 490 persons reported direct harassment in the same center uh, we also documented 249 acts of repudiation carried out by orders of the repressive, repressive bodies to threaten and intimidate activists and independent journalists. Also, attacks were recorded on homes that threatened and put entire households at risk. 
highlighting the case of Miranda Levia and her family that ended with part of the destruction of their home. In fact, in response to our request, the Commission granted a precautionary measure to protect the family and the state has completely ignored it. This center also registered at least 101 cases of torture and other cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment with violations of the physical integrity of the victims, which occurred during arrests, interrogations in prison, and also on the uh, on the road, on the public road. This was the case of Vaniba Ribo, who was beaten uh, for this by the state security officer, whose testimony was uh, presented before this commission. Different organizations, groups, and movements have been victims of persecution since the beginning of the pandemic in Cuba. Among them, many promoters of Cuba de Cide, both the unorganized and those who are part of the UNPACU or the opposition movement for a new republic, among others. Also members of San Isidro movement, independent journalists, activists, activists, ladies in white, and many more. Thus, the complaint center has been able to register 32 incidents related to violation of the due process established in the constitution fraudulently imposed in February 2019. My name is Catherine Mojena. I collaborate with the uh, uh, Complaint Center. I am an UPACU activist and promoter of Cuba de Cide. Honorable Commission, we will see four of the most recurrent repressive patterns on the island in the midst of the pandemic. One, use of healthcare centers and hospitals as places of reclusion and isolation and arrest for political reasons under the excuse of violations of measures imposed to prevent the pandemic. That is to say, the victims are apprehended in a certain place and transferred to healthcare centers and hospitals with the excuse of carrying out uh, medical examinations. However, relatives, lawyers, or defenders are denied all kind of information. They are they threaten medical personnel so that they do not provide data and after uh, between 12 and 2 and 14 hours victims are taken clandestinely from the place and taken to police headquarters or released thus evading all kinds of police reports that show the arbitrariness of the action and the involvement of the state in the act these kidnappings can also last for weeks that was the case of luis manuel otero alcantara who remained 29 days kidnapped in a militarized room of the Calixto Garcia Hospital in Havana after being detained to interrupt the hunger and thirst strike that he was holding. We have presented through the Secretariat the testimonies narrated by the victims. We express concern for the physical and mental integrity of the persons who frequently go to the Umpagu headquarters in looking for food and medicine, as well as the recurrent use of psychiatric hospitals to confine these persons to whom sedation, drugs, and electroshock therapy are administered against their will. That was the case of Marina Paz Lavaceno. After being arbitrarily arrested twice without medical criteria, she was transferred to a criminal ward of the Shawa Hospital in the San Luis municipality, 20 kilometers away from Santiago de Cuba, where she lives. Her daughter and husband came to the center. Marina was completely drugged. She tried to walk, she hit her head and was uh, taken away from uh, the place and the family was not able to see her. The doctor that received her didn't want to hospitalize her, but they ordered her hospitalization afterwards. In general, the police and the repressive and surveillance bodies use pre-existing regulations created in the framework of the pandemic to harass, beat, arrest, and even convict human rights defenders and independent citizens in order to limit their freedom of expression. In order to this pattern, we want to denounce that in recent months, the number of activists who remain in prison without trial has increased. For example, during uh, April 30, dozens of people were arbitrarily detained on Obispo Boulevard in Havana while trying to get to the home of Luis Manuel Otero, who was on a hunger strike. The official media of the Communist Party of Cuba, Grama, Describe protesters as a small group of them provocative criminals disguised as dissidents who put on another show. 
five of these persons, Esteban Rodríguez, Inti Soto, Thais Franco, Luis Angel Cuba, and Suizan Cancio, continue to be detained by the state security, accused of the crimes of public disorder and resistance, which can mean three months to five years of, um, in prison. We do not know about the health state of most of them. In another occasion, three citizens were arrested for protesting for the application of a fine to a street vendor in Las Tunas, Taimir Garcia, Damian Echeverria, and Adrián Góngora, who also remain in preventive prison, accused of the crimes of contempt, uh, resistance, and attack. Pattern number two, arbitrary confiscation and obstruction obstruction of aid and humanitarian work from civil society organizations, churches, and independent citizens. Thus, the state uses arbitrary and even illegal methods to prevent access to food, medicine, and money after destined for people living in extreme poverty. We want to call the attention of the commission about the state of the Cuban state of almost 45 tons of humanitarian aid made up of food and medicine collected by citizens uh, in the United States, civil society and Christian churches inside and outside the territory through the initiative Solidarity Between Brothers. With this theft, the state violated the right of Cubans to assist their families, the religious freedom of the churches, the legitimate owners of the cargo from whom it was stolen without uh, any expl explanation. And also, uh, a crime of the 1,500 families in vulnerable situations who had previously registered from the outlet to request this assistance. Many of them continue to claim it peacefully. In the midst of the health and economic crisis, the state uses its resources to persecute human rights defenders, not only to stop their activism, but also to prevent them from helping those in need. For example, the Umpago headquarters is under police siege as we speak, or police offenses. Let us now listen to the testimony of Jose Daniel Ferrer, General Coordinator of the uh, Union Patriotica de Cuba. The repression of the Castrista uh, regime against the promoters of Cuba Decide campaign against activists of the Union Patriotica de Cuba, un pacu of the San Isidro movement of the ladies in white and all the civil society that is independent and belongs to the people in general has been intensified every day. During the last two months, the regime has put in prison uh, more than 20 activists. Political prisoners are in great danger in the prisons of the regime where the surges of COVID-19 pandemic have not uh, been controlled. Prisoners living in human conditions and their constant harassment and violence on part of the officers and common criminals that work for the political police. Defenses of the repressive forces and arbitrary measures regarding uh, home detention against peaceful activists, journalists, and independent artists continues. The headquarters of the UMPACU is under siege, surrounded by fences since July 2020. Up to today, more than 200 detentions of activists have taken place they were trying to get to our headquarters. That is also where my family lives. They also detain or do not allow a person, persons looking for food or medical attention and medicines. They do not allow them to get to our headquarters. More than 250 persons have been victims of repressive actions and threats so they do not visit us. More than 20 activists were fined arbitrarily during the last few months, because according to the political police, they violate the security perimeter that they have arbitrarily established around our headquarters. Nelson Sayas Maceo, 
a name, a person from Santiago de Cuba was imprisoned and is in provisional um, imprisonment in Aguadore because he was not, he didn't want to be um, prevented from visiting the headquarters. Activists that are still, who still want to visit our headquarters because that is their right, they suffer from fines and violence. They are constantly threatened and repressive forces also put pressure and threaten vendors, food vendors, and also in order to prevent them from sending their products with the aim of letting us die of hunger. The crisis that our nation is going through worsens and the repression at the same time increases with the aim of uh, impeding the demonstrations of popular discontent. We have heard this testimony that shows that the regime in Cuba in implements um, mechanisms of terror to prevent uh, help during this humanitarian crisis. Police fences around houses and acts of reputation, those of independent activists, political opponents, communicators, and human rights defenders. We have documented unknown hundreds of incidents in which citizens are forced to stay in their homes under police surveillance or are arrested. With this repressive method, the state also violates the right of movement within and outside the national territory. In addition, through the organs of the Ministry of the Imperial and the Communist Party, the state has instigated hundreds of acts of reputations in which dozens of people gather without complying with the protection measures to shut, expla uh, vandalize, and even assault homes of the activists where they are uh, inside with their families. These acts of terror provoked at the very least psychological effects on those attacked, especially when they are minors or elderly. This constitutes um, state terrorism. A transcript of Aniel Valdez Cruz testimony was delivered to the Secretariat of the Commission where she recounted the multiple attacks, harassment suffered by her and her family in recent times less below uh, let's listen now the video look look what they are doing we are dying of hunger look what they are doing at the people we are hungry Look what the estate is doing in in my home. There are minors inside. They have killed our dog. 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 Murderers. They killed our dog. I would also like to report that Michael Castillo, after being under siege for several days, has now been incarcerated in Quiro Cinco, in Medio. He's accused of an attempt and resistance. And this is a risk everyone faces when they are sieged. Michael is uncommunicated and he has been unable to update his testimony, but because of the gravity of the facts and the risks for him and all the defendants, 
we present his testimony from March 2021. Good morning, my name is Michael Castillo. I'm one of the 15 persons in San Isidro asking for the liberation of our friend Dennis. We were uh, violently removed from there. And for that, they used excuses. Some of them, some of us were on a hunger strike and we were very weak. Days before that, we had attended the police stations and read poetry. Some of them, uh, sometimes they would um, incarcerate us using the justification of the pandemic. That's what they do to incarcerate people who think differently. They keep on incarcerating people who do not agree with the current regime. They have incarcerated people for one entire month there are arbitrary detentions, sometimes violent detentions. One night, Luis Manuel Otero and I were beaten in front of the police station in Havana, in Old Havana, that was done by approximately 10 police officers. We were in cuffs. They also, they also beat an other activist, a woman, and none of these detentions or harassments are legally done and the police and the agents of security continue to um, violate the sanitary measures. And these violations become worse and worse. They um, deceive people in the neighborhoods to get them to our, uh, to our houses and even make them throw acids at us. This makes this violence makes Cubans fight other Cubans and they have even entered our homes with children inside. In my house, I was in my house with my daughter and my nephew. I saw my uh, mouth and went to the police officer and asked for the liberation of another police, uh, another political prisoner. In Cuba, there are over 130 political prisoners. Some of them are tortured and humiliated. Uh, Vigilio Mantilla is suffering COVID and, COVID and we don't know how he is because he is not allowed to call anyone. Our jails are flooded with COVID-19 and the regime has been unable to control this situation. Prisoners in Cuba are dying of COVID and no one knows that. Finally, I want to tell about the violence a group of artists and journalists in January 2021 in front of the Ministry for Culture. We went to ask for replies from our call for our colleagues. We read poetry and the officials came out with the excuse of the pandemic and the minister even beat one of us. And then the uh, police officers hit us all, even the women, they actually broke the finger of one of us. They got us in a truck and they detained us. It was terrible. And even today, after our reports, those officials continue in their positions. That is the terrible reality in Cuba, a state of emergency where the pandemic is being used as a justification and repression and also as for repression and economic extortion because the state finds the population for even the slightest thing. Many of the members of our movement have precautionary measures that have been issued by the commission, but they are not respected by this totalitarian regime. Our rights continue to be violated. Our families continue to be harassed. Our citizens continue to be harassed and the repression against us has increased. And we are just artists asking for our freedom of movement. And we want to have the right to have rights. So homeland and life, that's what we want. We have received several reports that uh, suggest that the situation of contagions in COVID of uh, COVID-19 in jails is critical. We will deliver it as soon as we can present it. The fourth 
um, pattern is the abuse of the regulations associated with the prevention of COVID-19 to impose fines on communicators and citizens for documenting and reporting abuses by the state and also interruptions to the communication services. The abuse of new and pre-existing regulations together with the manipulation of telecommunications and internet services are used as a social control mechanism in order to prevent the free flow of information, isolate people and hinder internal communication. Any excuse or argument serves to prevent people from interacting or mobilizing in solidarity actions. Fines of up to 3,000 pesos are imposed, sometimes even more. Specifically, independent journalists who transmit information in the context of the pandemic are fined, harassed, and often arbitrarily detained. And we want to alert about the intervention of the state to disconnect the internet and cell phone service. This repressive pattern is directed at independent activists and journalists so as to impede their work. Likewise, on numerous occasions, the state has cut the internet service of the entire population of a territory and blocked social networks and messaging applications. All these actions are denounced in the testimony of the journalist Ilana Hernandez that appears in the report delivered to the commission. Thank you, Caterina. My name is Rosa Maria Paya. I am promoter of Cuba Decide. Honorable commissioners, the testimonies of human of women human rights defenders concern us in a special way. We want to draw your attention to the situation of these women who are victims of attacks, reprisals, and threats and are affected individually and also in their families. Women human rights defenders do the same work as their male colleagues. However, they face additional challenges and threats with differentiated impacts that require attention and special protection mechanisms. Human rights defenders carry out their activism within a dictatorship that daily restricts the rights of all citizens and that systematically violates women and their particular conditions. In this sense, we have identified three patterns of repression that are mainly directed at women defenders by Cuban state agents. It is necessary to, to say that these dictatorial measures are, can also be faced by men, but from a gender perspective analysis, they especially impact on uh, women defenders and put them in situations of additional vulnerability while they try to exercise their right to defend human rights. The first pattern are arbitrary arrests. They are frequently carried out by state security agents on women. And usually these are men who together with women agents in police stations force defenders to undress in front of male agents. Additionally, on some occasions, the defenders meet, are, they are with their children who are minors and they are arbitrarily detained and taken together with their mothers to police centers. We will now present the case of Selina Osoria from the city of Guantanamo. She is an activist and their, her daughters were beaten by state security agents during a raid. Another pattern are threats threats against women human rights defenders, which are largely related to consequences for their children, because that would be the way to punish them if they were continue, to continue with their activism. For example, expelling their children for, from sports or artistic projects or banning them from jobs or university studies, thus pressuring the activists to prioritize access to opportunities for their children over their work as human rights defenders. Now we will show the testimony of Ariadna Mena, promoter of Cuba Decide in Havana. I'm sorry, uh, it isn't, there's a problem with the audio, just a second. Are we going to be able to see Ariadna's testimony? I'm being told that uh, the volume is too low, so we will send you the video so you can listen to her. The third pattern we have identified are homes under siege. 
For some years now, the Department of State Security, together with the police, have prevented activists from leaving their homes, even when they try, they want to purchase uh, goods or to attend the doctor. The number of days the besieged homes are kept is arbitrary, as well as the number of people who can leave or enter the homes. And women are the most affected based on the fact that a large percentage of Cuban homes are sustained by women. And they are responsible for the care of children and family nutrition. Next, we present the testimony of Liliana Hernandez, a journalist who has been besieged for most of this year at her residence. I am Ileana Hernandez, a journalist of Cyber Cuba Noticias and a political activist. I wanted to tell you that on April 8th, I was detained by the police of this country on uh, Obispo Street. I was detained from 1 p.m. to 8 p.m. when they released us and led us to our homes. We were approximately five or six people they detained just because we were walking on Obispo Street. We were just going to have lunch. And after that day on the 9th, I woke up under siege and I am still sieged today. On April 23rd, I left my home with a couple of friends and I was also detained that day between 4 p.m. and 8 p.m. approximately. They also brought me home again. Then on April 16th, they took my internet connection from my cell phone ever since I have been unable to access the internet from my official phone line. And the same is happening to my family. No one in my house can access internet. And in, in the domestic Wi-Fi, the domestic Wi-Fi we have in Cuba, we are unable to access the internet. Our service seems to be okay. The speed is minimal. We cannot watch videos. We cannot send videos. The connection, the, the connection's quality is quite bad. Ever since, since April 9th, I haven't been able to leave my house, as I said before. And even today, these are the conditions I'm living in. I'm being told that now we will be able to share Ariadna's testimony. Hi, my name is Ariadna Mendez Rubio. I am a human rights defender. I have been so for 15 years. I am also an activist and promoter of the campaign Cuba Decides. I am the mother to two children. They are 16 and 17 years old, both girls, and we have suffered and been traumatized by the Cuban government, a totalitarian government, a dictatorship. In 2009, my daughter was expelled from her gymnastics academy. In 2015, my daughter was expelled from the National School of Ballet. And in 2019, sorry, my daughter was expelled from all her study institutions. And the same happened to my youngest daughter. She hasn't been able to access school. And that's just because I think in a different way. I have been arrested several times. I have been persecuted. I have even been under siege up to the point that I haven't been able to go out to find food for my daughters. And all of this is just because I don't agree with the government because I wanted to raise my voice to feed my homeland because I demanded the Cuban regime to stop with the torture, to stop with the re repression, to stop with everything they are doing against our people. As I said before, I have been arrested, arrested and tortured, both physical and psychologically. I have also been arrested and I have been taken on a patrol car and they kept me in the patrol car exposed to the sun. Everyone knows the climate in Cuba and they didn't even care about the consequences that could have. I they was also taken to police stations and they took my clothes. 
naked. They left me naked in front of all the officers who were there in front of me. Cuba is a dictatorship. In Cuba, the rule is repression. There is no respect for human rights. In Cuba, no one is safe just because they don't think like the government. This is what's going on here in Cuba. I would like to thank all the testimonies from the activists who from the island have been sending their experiences uh, with the repression. In addition to the four general repressive patterns and the three patterns that affect human rights defenders, we want to denounce before this commission the state of total vulnerability in which human rights defenders find themselves in Cuba when they need medical attention. Hospitals, health centers, and even access to medical care are managed by the state as one another repressive mechanism. That is the case of Santa Fernandez Diaz, who recently went to a clinic because she felt problems with her blood pressure, but she preferred to run away from the place when she saw state security agents talking to the doctor who was going to treat her. Santa has denounced that she has been admitted to hospital and received electroshock therapy for protesting against the abuse of the authorities. Another uh, specifically terrible case is the case of Jacqueline Borrego Cuesta, an activist of the opposition movement for a new republic, a promoter of Cuba designs that passed away on May 10. In 2018, she suffered a multiple uh, seizure in her, in, sorry, a cerebral infarction that affected a large part of her body. Her husband denounced her state, but she was refused medical care. She needed medication and supply, but she did not receive care to improve her quality of life because she was a human rights activist. She also needed physical therapy, but the authorities told her families that the specialists were unable to treat her and that most of the uh, staff were treating patients with coronavirus. Now, when the pandemic is reaching record numbers in the island, we would like to express our concern for the systematic use of these and other human rights violation protests and their dramatic consequences for the families in Cuba. It is evident that as the peaceful protests grow, there have been over a thousand this year, and the mobilization in favor of democratic change in Cuba, acts of terror from the, from the state against citizens also grow but using coercion and violence against specific groups to instill fear in the population is the definition of terrorism. And the dictatorship is practicing daily in my country. The regime exercises state terrorism against the Cuban people. So we have several recommendations for this commission, but I'm seeing that our 35 minutes are up. So if that's okay, we can stop now and then listen to your, now listen to your comments. Thank you very much. I will now give the floor to my colleagues, to Commissioner Estuardo Rallon as the country rapporteur. Thank you so much. And I would also like to greet my colleagues and the uh, team of the Executive Secretariat. I would like to point out the importance of this hearing, specifically because of the conditions in which the um, Cuban regime does not allow any type of visit or um, will not reply to the requests of the commission. And we see once again, the absence of the uh, Cuban state representatives. And I have um, wrote down what you have pointed out is specifically about the four patterns that exist systematically against activists, persons, and human rights defenders. For example, within the framework of the pandemic, instead of um, providing medical attention to uh, 
these people, it's very serious to understand that these places have become um, prisons or places where to carry out arbitrary detentions without any sort of due process. And also the um, fact that they are confiscating humanitarian aid at a critical moment. The fact that they won't allow 45 tons of humanitarian aid sent by the church and, ch and the church and the civil society to get to people in the island, I, I have found it sh shocking. Also, the uh, repudiation acts and the police fences, even seeing that there were children inside the homes is a completely traumatic situation. And they have also capitalized on the um, arbitrary context of the pandemic to find journalists or to interrupt uh, services that won't allow them to communicate. So I think that we're seeing very brave people who are presenting their testimony. We know that they expose themselves by doing so. We know that there are different civil society organizations who are working in Cuba. We have heard several people from Cuba Decide, but there are other movements and organizations that have sent the commission information. And I would like to point out the commitment of the plenary of the commission to address within our competence these requests. We have had um, reactions via tweets or press releases or uh, after granting precautionary measures. Another thing that caught my eye is the differentiated effect on women, on how these patterns still have a worse impact on women. Many of them who are the um, who have to support their homes, and it's not the same. It's terrible. The fact that they are creating a fence and won't be letting a person out, but it's even worse if we're talking about a woman who is alone and in charge of her home. And the power of that differentiated approach is very important. You also said that you have data about uh, contagion in jails that you were unable to present today. But I would like to um, ask Cuba decided to send us that information. It's very important to know how that works inside detention centers. And finally, I would like to wrap up with two ideas. The first one is that uh, at the face of such a complicated situation when the state is internationally bound by the Declaration of Human Rights, which it originally uh, subscribed to, in, uh, considering that they cannot uh, interact with the inter-American system, shedding light on these situations is the only way to raise your voice, to show that there are human rights obligations that are not being complied with. So we will continue to react within our competence. And the other idea I wanted to share is that even though there is one final report about the situation of human rights in Cuba, we see that this sort of behavior continues to appear. And if we want to see some respect for all human rights, it is necessary to be a change, to have a change in the regime so that there will be real democracy because only democracy will allow Cuba to meet the inter-American standards and the um, to comply with the obligations of the convention. And that is something we need to insist on so we can, um, so that human rights can be observed. So I would like to congratulate you for such um, 
full approach to the patterns and we will be expecting the information about the contagions within the uh, jails. I will now give the floor to Commissioner Hernandez, a rapporteur on uh, uh, human rights defenders. Thank you, Madam President. I also want to greet you. Uh, Commissioner Rallon has already done it. I want to greet the members of the civil society. This is a great opportunity to get to know from you the, the human rights situation in Cuba. I celebrate that we can have this hearing. We had technical difficulties in the previous period of sessions, and that prevented us from having from you about all human rights violations. I would also like to express my acknowledgement to the organizations here, Cuba Decide, but also San Isidro Movement, uh, Women in Black and White, who have been fighting and struggling during the last months. And the commission is aware of that. Thank you for the work you are carrying out. I think that Commissioner Rallon has emphasized what has to do with the commission's role um, when there is a lack of cooperation from the Cuban state. Let us not forget that one of the powers of the commission is to create awareness um, in the whole continent regarding human rights situations. And thanks to these kind of hearings, we are able to know what is going on in your country, but also through the platforms and that allow us to communicate immediately, we can address a broader audience about what is going on in Cuba so that we are fully aware about the situation. And I'm mentioning this because regarding precautionary measures, you have pointed out that they are not effective. This is not surprising to me. We know that for precautionary measures granted by the Commission, the willingness and cooperation of the state is required, and that does not exist. But the process to grant precautionary measures is one that is regulated in our rules, and it is carried out in a rigorous way to assess the situation of risk under which persons are. So thanks to this procedure and the analysis carried out by the Commission, we are able to call states to respect the life and integrity of the beneficiaries. This is another mechanism for the Commission to make visible the situation you are living in your country. I would like to make reference now to human rights defenders. You are all human rights defenders. We are all our human rights defenders here. And it really caught my attention hearing testimonies such as these, because what we are observing is a lack of acknowledgement of this right. This is a fundamental human right that is key and related to other rights. It is the way of expressing freedom of expression, of association, with a goal that is the defense of other basic human rights. So the testimonies provided make us see how human rights defenders are at risk. 
And one of the participants was saying that this is carried out through uh, cases, the act of defense becomes a criminal case in some occasions, and they may be deprived or of their freedom as um, punishment. I would like to express my solidarity with the Human Rights Defenders Group that is carrying out their work with great courage and you have never stopped working to defend your own rights but what is most important of all you're defending everyone's human rights for the second part i would like you to share whether you have a balance regarding discrimination and violence against women in the internal domestic legislation. I think that Commissioner Rolon also stressed the situation of special vulnerability under which women human rights defenders are that is simply to better understand what is going on in the island thank you thank you madam vice president commissioner margaret may my colleague has the floor um thank you madam president um i i have to admit that uh all, every one of the videos shown to us was very upsetting, but the last one was extremely, extremely disturbing and it's the stuff of nightmares. That woman was made into a skeleton. And Madam Vice President, I think we have to find a way when we receive information like this from a country like Cuba, which just ignores our precautionary measures, ignores our letters, um, Article uh, um, 18 letters, ignores whatever we do to assist civil society um, and human rights defenders in Cuba about human rights there. I think we perhaps we ought to pu produce press releases each and every time we receive substantive information, because that is one way we can assist by making the world know what is going on in Cuba. Lots of people know bits and pieces. They know it's an authoritarian communist regime, but I don't think they understand the depths of the suffering caused to so many of their, their citizens. And I think that is one way we can assist because we publish uh, press releases from information received about matters occurring in, in, in countries. And I think we have to do that with Cuba. Yes, the publication in the annual report at, um, at 4B uh, is, is one form of publication. Well, that's really is more publication within our uh, um, area of, of, of uh, work. But we need a worldwide reaction. And, and I am really concerned as the Rapporteur of Women's Rights to see a woman made to get to that level by a regime just because they are opposed to them and voice their opposition is, I don't have words to describe it. And I know for a fact as well, because I've received reports, because I'm also the rapporteur on Afro-descendant rights, I've received reports about Afro-Cuban women 
and Afro-Cuban men and the treatment they receive as well. So I hope Madam, Ma Madam Vice President, you could ensure that we discuss this before this period of, of, of session ends, whether we could do that each time we receive information of, of substance from the people on the ground in Cuba about what happens there. I think we have, because only worldwide pressure maybe would, would assist. Um, I, I really can't go on, I'm getting too emotional. So um, uh, um, um, my, my brother, Commissioner Alon spoke, Sister Mesti, and so did my brother, Howell. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Commissioner, I take them notes and undoubtedly this is a key issue. And before giving the floor to the rapporteurs, I would like to ask a specific questions and especially thank you for the information you have brought, but for your daily work as well, because you are struggling against the current. And I had a specific questions regarding uh, sexual violence in particular, whether you have information about sexual violence suffered by women, human rights defenders, and the tensions. And among the patterns that you have mentioned, there are threats against their children of expelling them. Are there threats of uh, gender-based violence uh, against the children of human rights defenders, uh, threats of rape as well. And I am the rapporteur for the rights of the elderly. And in a country such as Cuba, with a long history of serious human rights violations, I am asking about the situation of the elderly women, men, who are affected by this situation, who have started their activism long ago. So I wanted to know whether you had a specific information about the elderly. I think there's a lot more to think about when you mentioned about uh, the households that are being surrounded by fences, all the violence that exists at that uh, in that situation, not only um, the threats, but also sexual violence in that context. I will now give the floor to the Special Rapporteur on Social, Economic, Cultural and Environmental Rights, Soledad Garcia. Thank you, Madam President, Ma Vice President of the Commission. I want to greet the Commission my colleague, Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, but especially the organizations that are providing such valuable information. And I want to congratulate you on the organization of the hearing. Have you have presented this information to show how this violation of the human rights occurs? We've been following closely the human rights violations in Cuba from the special rapporteurships. And I'm worried about these patterns you have presented and damage right to housing, health or food, among other human rights violations. I have specific requests and also would like to receive further information to complete our map regarding these special uh, the information the special rapporteurship has, I would like to know whether there are uh, challenges for the persons defending labor rights in Cuba and regarding cultural rights in a recent press release, the commission of special rapporteurship, we put emphasis on those rights. We got to know Manuel Otero's artwork were damaged and this artivism that you mentioned is of great concern. And also regarding right to food, there was also a press release published with the commission on May 25th, letting everyone know about the food scarcity in Cuba. You present this as a pattern suffered by human rights defenders and 
all information will be well received. I want to thank you, especially to those persons who have given their testimonies today. Thank you, Rapporteur, Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam President, Commissioners, Commissioner Margaret, Soledad Garcia, and human rights defenders that are making this effort. I also want to thank you for the information shared. I agree. It, it is a good thing we can have this hearing without any interruptions. I don't know if you received the information I wanted to share with you at that time, and I wanted to say that we, that the freedom of expression report published by the rapporteurship not long ago, the first conclusion is that Cuba is the only country of the hemisphere that is no guarantee of the right of freedom of expression. And this is a statement that is very solid and should be repeated until there are fun under there are changes in the island there is a monopoly of the means of of the media outlet and what you are sharing the petitioners are sharing is information that probably part of the qn society is not able to see so this is information that the commission values the rapporteurship really appreciates this information. The report also mentioned access to the internet and also the constitutional framework that contradicts international standards regarding freedom of expression. And I know it's hard, but the truth is that although there are definitions of a democratic country, this cannot be considered as such unless there are guarantees to the right of freedom of expression. The monitoring carried out by the rapporteurship has to do with the persistence of this diagnosis, but also we should bear in mind that the situation has worsened. We have published press releases about these precautionary measures. There's constant monitoring, and I think that would be acknowledged by the commission, but also the person suffering from these restrictions that the international community is aware of this in spite of the resistance of the authorities to provide information and comply with the precautionary measures granted. I would like to congratulate you the civil society's work in Cuba. I had the privilege of working in the region for many years. And seven years ago, we couldn't find information about Cuba. And it's not because the restrictions have changed, but there's a process of a strengthening of the civil society gathering information in a rigorous way about these kind of actions. And our concerns have to do with information gathered, shared, such as these videos. Madam Vice President, I would like to mention two things. I have some questions. The first question we have seen in some videos that there's a kind of harassment to the physical space of the citizens, not only by um, officers, but some uh, sectors of the citizenship that share, agree with the authorities. This is going on among the citizens of Cuba. And also regarding internet, restrictions. This is something that was mentioned in the hearing, but it's very important for the mandate of the rapporteurship to gather further information about 
uh, connectivity restrictions. And also, I want to say that I share uh, what Commissioner Macaulay has said. There's, there's a great effort made by the Commission, by the Special Rapporteurship, and thank you. Thank you, Co uh, Special Rapporteur, Commissioner Macaulay, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I got so emotional, I forgot to even say hello and thank you and all this. But I wanted to mention something that I was not surprised about the, the um, uh, um, hijacking of the humanitarian aid and so on. Because many years ago, when I was chair of the Caribbean Women's Rights Group, we collected, the Jamaica Arm, we collected a whole lot of stuff to take to Cuba because we were going on a visit to have meetings there. And we took the precaution of having our foreign minister here had have an, an agreement with the foreign minister there in writing that we were going to take this, all this stuff, food items, clothing, uh, um, sanitary stuff, hygiene stuff and so on. And we would distribute them. And this was, we got it in writing. And when we traveled and we arrived there, some group of, of security people came and wanted to take the stuff away and said they will keep it for us. We said, no, you're not going to do that. And we insisted on having a room at the airport where we checked and only one door and we put a, went and got a padlock and put it on and locked it and said that if anybody touched it, I was, I was in charge and I was the only lawyer. We would make it an international incident. They did not touch it. And we went out to the elderly, retired people, young couples with children, schools and so on, because we had a Jamaican who knew Cuba with us. And we went to all the places and distributed the things ourselves. But they, if we hadn't done that, they would have taken it away from us. Yes. And it's it's, it's an a, a, a amazing place uh, to go. When we went, we would talk, but never with the government. We would only talk, the Federation of Women would, would have meetings with us, but they are government organization. So I, I just wanted to mention that, that we can Gracias. still do it, but we have to be, take precautions. Gracias, Commissioner. And I really respect you and honor you for your, your courage, uh, um, all the work that the people who work there, because once you step into a bare human rights defender there and uh, articulate about it, you jeopardize your life and sometimes your family's life. So. Gracias, Commissioner. Le voy a dar la palabra a la sociedad civil para poder responder y comentar. We will now give the floor to the civil society organizations to give a response. Thank you. Sí, adelante. Go ahead. Muchas gracias, Commissioner. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Now, with regards to your question about the adoption of internal measures with regards to the legislation on women's issues, it's a historical debt the Cuban state has to its society because there are no public institutions that ensure the rights of women. They have even denied, uh, refused, sorry, to create uh, the Ministry for Women and to sign human rights treaties. The state of Cuba hasn't even undersigned the Inter-American Convention for the Prevention and Eradication of Violence Against Women, the so-called uh, Convention of Belén do Pará from 1994. So, it's not something the state has worked on, and it's definitely not one of its concerns. With regards to the question about sexual violence and detentions, there 
are several accounts about abuses, uh, cases of abuse by uh, security forces against women, for example, through videos that became viral on the social networks and that independent media were able to uh, share. Um, report was presented about two teenagers who were abused by the police originally because they did not meet the curfew. This was on April 16th last year in Havana, and these teenagers were not taken to a police station. These two girls were taken to a nearby farm where one of the officials um, abused one of them while the other one raped one of the girls who was underage. There have been reports of sexual violence against activists when they were detained by the authorities. We can send this information to the uh, commission. Thank you, Juan Carlos. I would like to start by thanking you for your reactions and for the space and personally for your words, because after your reactions, we see that there is a real concern from this commission about the situation of human rights in Cuba and the situation of human rights defenders in my country. Thank you so much to the uh, rapporteurships and rapporteur Rallon for his words and his expressed commitment to receive the requests of the civil society of Cuba, especially the, the reports of the Cuban Civil Society Commission, Commissioner McCauley, thank you so much for your solidarity. And I would like to um, thank you for your invitation, uh, the, the, the invitation of the commission, because we do need a world reaction to what's going on. We need the world to know. For decades in Cuba, we have been carrying the propaganda of the regime over our shoulders and that wall between the propaganda and the um, reality. So what uh, the citizens of the world see and the reality, that wall that tries to stop the solidarity of the world, a real solidarity, immediate solidarity once people learn about the truth and that is why we um, we have um, would like to request this commission to create a special mechanism to follow up the situation in Cuba in whatever way you find suitable. But it is necessary to have a special mechanism to follow up the situation in Cuba. It is fundamental to uh, have visibility so that we can see um, the reaction in the world. As Ms. McCauley was mentioning, you can be the voice of all the human rights defender whose testimonies don't can not be heard because we're talking about families with citizens fighting against a state with all of its resources. I would like to answer some of your questions. Commissioner Ranold was uh, Ralon was asking about contagion in the um, in jails. Unfortunately, we don't have documents to back up the exact dimension of the problem. The reports we have been receiving so far tell us about a crisis inside the jails, not only because of the um, contagion of the virus, but also because of the uh, scarcity, the entire population is suffering of uh, products, foods, medication. Hunger is one of the most frequent complaints in the Cuban society, and it's even worse inside penitentiaries. Um, our uh, cities are the, one uh, political prisoner said that they have been hunting rats inside a prison center. Unfortunately, the information we have 
is anecdotal. We can send you the testimonies. As you know, it's very difficult to access real statistics, but uh, we heard the case of Esteban Rodriguez, who was one who was part of the Obispo manifestation. And uh, we believe that he is recovering from COVID. His family has said that he um, became infected with COVID. We believe he is getting better, but it is very difficult to get in touch with them, especially because of what the state does to interrupt communications. There was a question from uh, pre pre the president, Julissa, uh, a good question about the situation of older persons. It's one of the most affected populations in the midst of a health crisis, an economic crisis that has a humanitarian scale. It's one of the populations that have remained the most helpless. And it's one of the populations that have been more impacted by policies like the suspension and the seizure of humanitarian aid. Many of the people who uh, go to the Umpaku uh, headquarters to receive food are older persons who are arrested. You listen to some about some of the cases and then they are locked down in psychiatric centers with no medical um, justification. The situation they suffer is really abusive, especially those who are in vulnerable groups, especially those who are in extreme poverty. Unfortunately, again, we don't have all of these statistics, but definitely it's something quite urgent for us. And I would like to mention with regards to that, Again, uh, the two cases where we um, talked about the right to food, I think Commissioner, I think Soledad Garcia mentioned this and also Commissioner May McCulley, when she referenced the humanitarian aid, this was a citizen effort because everything was collected in only one day. And we had the same experience you had when you brought the aid from Jamaica. If the Cuban state interferes, we have no warranties that aid will reach the citizens. Actually, there are many, many reports. There are even pictures of products whose, um, that are, whose sale is forbidden in Cuba that were sold by the Cuban state. So that's why we ask you to raise your voice to defend the right Cubans living abroad to help their families inside the island without the intervention of the state, without the intervention of the state. Because the moment the state intervenes, there's no warranty that aid will really get to those who need it the most. That's what happened to us, over 15,000 families vulnerable families were robbed by the Cuban state in the midst of a humanitarian crisis like the one we are seeing. So thank you so much for your question. And this is all because, uh, and with regards to the blocking of the signals, the internet signals and the access to information, this was asked by the Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression. This is a reality in our country because the access to the internet has expanded and we must make a distinction. It's, it cannot be compared to the access to the internet we see in our hemisphere. There's a lot of control over it. It's, uh, everything is watched by the state. It's so expensive that most people cannot afford it, but even this um, small access to the internet is affected the moment the state decides that will be the case. It has happened in regions, for example, at a point where the uh, Cuban citizens are in a stage of a lot of agitation. We have had over 1,000 protests in Cuba. And in the territories where you see the protests, suddenly the internet is gone and there's no Facebook, no social networks. 
and that has happened in several places in the last couple of months, we can uh, send you the information and the most specific data as you have requested. I'm trying to see if there was if there were any questions left unanswered. I see that we don't have much time, but I would like you to to listen because a minute, a few minutes before the beginning of this broadcast, we received a report from the uncle of Denis Solis. Uh, he's Cuban and has been in prison for several months. He's a member of the San Isidro movement. Please, this is what his uncle told us. Do we have it ready? He's a political prisoner. He just called me and told me to um, make this report on his behalf. He's telling me that there's a improvised re-educator. His name is Norberto Rodriguez Fajardo, who goes there. And the other man is called Alberto Hernández Crear. He is the officer and Norberto Rodriguez Fajardo, and they are both provoking him so that he will uh, misbehave. So since they know that he's in his last days, they want him to, to do something wrong to mess with his life. And I'm telling you this because Denny is asking me to report this. And we have always told him to behave, but they are provoking him. They are provoking him so that he will become violent and misbehaves in prison in order to complicate his life. That's what they want. So I would like to denounce an officer the officer they gave him, his name is Michel. This man on Friday, which was Father's Day and his birthday, brought him a dinner, pork chops, a good dinner. And then he says that he realized that in the hall where they were, where that officer appeared, there was a camera. They were trying to record Denny eating the dinner on Father's Day with the officer in order to discredit him before the world public opinion. Denny told me that, and he said that this officer intimidated him and made him eat the dinner with him in such a way that uh, he had to take the dinner and take it with him because he kept on harassing him so that he would eat on camera. So the following day, that happened on Sunday. And on Monday, he also showed up with the same thing. Again, more intimidation. And Denis Solis Gonzalez says that he told him that once he's on the street, they have a surprise for him. I don't know what they mean. It must be something evil. They are threatening him for the moment he leaves, he gets out. Thank you. And that's the situation of human rights defenders in Cuba. They are completely vulnerable and the state has its entire legal and criminal apparatus ready to justify the fact that they are in prison. And if they cannot find justification, they provoke them. That is the case of Denis Solis, who has been in jail for months with no justification. In rapporteur for human rights defenders, Mr. Joel Hernandez was saying, and I think this is fundamental here in the work of the Cuban civil society. He was saying that the first violation is the violation to um, the right to defend rights. And I find this particularly um, terrible because my father, who was murdered by uh, the uh, security agents of Cuba, my father defended the right to defend the rights of the Cuban people. And we, we hope we can count on you to um, help us to defend the right, to defend the rights of all Cubans, something that is urgent, that, that is the, the world reaction that we need. 
we hope we can build it also with you. That is why we request for you to demand the liberation of all political prisoners, the end of the violence against citizens, for you to uh, demand the right to uh, of citizens to receive humanitarian aid without the intervention of the states, especially in this crisis, crisis, also that you would extort the Cuban state to take measures that allow legislative progress in the area of human rights, such as the signing of the Inter-American Democratic Charter and the signing of the Inter-American Convention to prevent, punish, and eradicate violence against women, that the commission requests an in loco visit to Cuba. We know that they will not reply, but please request the visit, try to confirm what's going on with human rights there. And five, the representatives of the Cuban state lack the legitimacy of origin and practice and are not ready to be fair or to defend human dignity. Because after 62 years of totalitarianism, in a moment when my crisis, my country has already reached uh, the worst humanitarian crisis, please create a special follow-up mechanism for Cuba. Thank you so much, Jose Maria and Juan Carlos. As I said a couple of minutes ago, not only for being here, but for the constant daily work you do. The Inter-American Commission greets you and thanks you and is um, fully aware of your requests. And as Vice President, I want to say this publicly, it's very, this, the case of Cuba is very important for the Inter-American Commission. And I consider myself lucky to be here with my colleagues so that we can think, so we can think as Commissioner McCauley was asking us to do something within our monitoring duty. The commission cannot do more than what it mandate allows it to, but it won't do less. Sometimes the states think that it's up to a ratification. Of course, there are circumstances for the obligations of the state, but I always go back to the origin. When the Universal Declaration for Human Rights was created, that was because the international community realized that the states that were supposed to protect their inhabitants don't always do. And the first article says that all people are born free and equal and in dignity. And human dignity is capable of breaking any wall. So once again, thank you so much for being here. Um, we I know you have we have your hope and that's a big responsibility for us. I hope you bring our voice and I hope you let it be you know that we are here to work with your hope. Thanks once again. I would like to thank my colleagues, the executive secretariat. Thank you so much for what you're doing, for being here and for what you do every day. Until dignity becomes what's normal. Thank you very much.